So I know that I said in the last Project Soapway video that I was on my way to Disney, but as some of you know, I was actually recording everything beforehand, and on that day, I was on my way to Disney, but I've been back for a couple days at this point, and I had a great time. It was a wild time, actually. A lot of fun, just overall. Like, the overall theme was a ton of fun, but there was a lot of very interesting things that were learned and mostly by open clay kidlet number two, which was a rough time and she's kind of going through it. And so I've spent a couple extra days, you know, with her since we've been back just chilling and getting back into our routines and making sure that she feels all of the comfort and everything that she needs from routines and mom and all the things. But the overall of it is we had a really great time and I will be telling you all more about that in an upcoming video with Mr. Soap and Clay on a different thing that we're, we're doing, but that is not what we are doing this week. I will tell you what we are doing this week in just a minute, but before I do, hello, I am Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things. And you are here for week 23 of year three. And yeah, as I said, back from Disney. Thanks for being okay with me being gone. But today we are going to be starting a deep dive playlist history of thing in regards to what we started a couple weeks ago with the shampoo bar recipes. Now, as I said, in the shampoo bar recipes, you know, week where I gave four different or five different recipes for shampoo. I have not done shampoo recipes and really talked about shampoo a whole lot on the channel since year one for a reason. And that reason is uh, soap makers be wild and out all of the time. They always find something to like argue about and it's all always incredibly stupid because Soap is not as complicated as the soap makers try to make it, but it's especially divisive when it comes to shampoo, and it is wild. And quite frankly, I just don't want to deal with the bullshit that comes along with talking about shampoo recipes. Should you use a Sindep bar? Should it be a cold process bar? Because every time that I do talk about those things, people expect me to like choose a side, right? First and foremost, I don't believe that there is a side that can be chosen when it comes to this, there, nor should there be. There are very few things in life that are like fundamentalist, black and white, this is right and this is wrong. Like very few things in life. And me as a person who is forever evolving and growing and changing and learning, I don't like picking sides on much of anything, especially not with something as stupid as shampoo or soap or whatever. Because there is more than one way to cleanse your hair, to condition your hair, to cleanse your body, to condition your body, and to pretend otherwise, quite frankly, makes you an idiot. And I will not mince words with that. But because there were so many questions and we were getting into the soapy science of all of this while we were doing the shampoo recipes, both cold process or hot process or melt and pour or with Sindep bars, so I guess all, with all of those, a lot of questions did come up. And so I thought it might be a good idea to do an FAQ this week and really talk about what all of that means, answer some of those soapy science questions, and really at the end of it, give you my stance on what shampoo is right for your hair. Now this is not some sort of, you know, stay tuned for part four or 14 or whatever for my ultimate opinion on it. Like I don't have the desire to do any of that clickbaity stuff. So like at the top, really what I just said is accurate. I don't believe that there is a side. I believe that 
full process shampoo. So shampoo formed out of a soap recipe or a synthetic shampoo. So shampoo formed out of synthetic detergents. Both have their place within the hair care world. And I thought that it might be a good idea to go ahead and go through the history of shampoo and synthetic detergents and not so much soap because we've already covered that in a history of soap, you know, before to really give you guys an idea of why I believe that there is no right or wrong way to shampoo your hair. And I think that a lot of people who insist that there is are probably being misled by, you know, marketing and society and trends because we as humans tend to follow those things. And so I thought it might be a good idea to go through the history of following those things when it comes to shampoo. And I think this is going to be a really cool series. Normally with my deep dives, I tend to do just one long video, right? But for this one, I'm going to chunk it out into more manageable sections. We're going to be pouring soap or stamping soap or whatever in between. So you don't have to look at me the whole time and it will be, you know, just kind of easier, more manageable videos for you to consume in, you know, 20 minutes or so. And then we move on to the next thing. So, that is the plan for this playlist and this deep dive. I hope you guys are okay with that. I will probably be wearing the same shirt through all of this because I'm probably just gonna sit here for three hours and film it all. So we're going to start out with part one, which is going to be the history of shampoo essentially up until the 1930s, because I do think it's important to think about the way that humans actually cleansed their hair for all of that time. And that is also an important thing to remember. Shampoo, the way that we know it today in the little squeeze bottles with the synthetic detergent being comprised primarily of water is kind of a new thing. It's only been around for a hundred years. And the reason that it was invented was not because shampoo with synthetic detergents was better for the hair. Not at all why. And so I thought that it might be a good idea to start out with what we did to cleanse our hair, you know, as humans, over all of that time, up until shampoo, as we know it today, was invented. So that's what we're going to start with today. Let's get to the pouring or whatever. I don't know what I'm pouring today. It might be coconut lime, I'm not really sure, but we'll find out You know, when we get there. And we will talk more about the history of shampoo from you know, earliest recorded shampoo history now. So let's go do that. Haley Tentoic Days. That's totally a thing. Yeah. So we are going to go over the history of cleansing the hair, really, from as far back as we can really go to essentially the 1930s. And we're not going to cover this, you know, really in depth because we have done so with the history of soap making. And in reality, the history of cleansing one's hair is pretty similar to that. But, you know, high level from what we remember with the history of soap making deep dive, you know, people were able to make soap as early as 2800 BC, right? Ancient Babylonians. And that's all great. And we did find, we do have information that suggests that they were also, you know, using said soap to shampoo their hair. But the way that humans would cleanse their hair from, you know, ancient times all the way up to, you know, the 1930s actually was a lot different than kind of how we know hair care and, you know, hair washing today. The biggest mainstay with all of this was they were not washing their hair on the daily or really what anyone would really consider frequently at all with the exception of the Japanese which we'll talk about in a minute but we have examples of all types of different hair processes to keep the hair clean without actually using a surfactant within it right now as a quick refresher a surfactant right definitions of surfactant a necessary component within all of cleansing right because the whole idea of a surfactant or a surface active agent is to create something that is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic at the same time and in that creation of that molecule it is allowing the product to essentially break apart the dirt the grime the oil the grease on your skin or your hair in order for water to essentially wash it away. If you didn't have that duality essentially with the hydrophobic and the hydrophilic in your cleansing routine, really what that would mean is that water would just kind of roll off of soap instead of, you know, breaking apart those binds and creating, you know, bubbles and foam and all the cool stuff. So a surfactant is a necessary part of cleansing anything. The easiest surfactant to make is, and has been for thousands of years, you know, soap. And 
And that's really where humanity has been for a very long time. Using an alkaline soap in order to do all of the cleansing. We're talking all of the cleansing of like skin and hair, but also cleansing of clothing and dishes and all of that. But while it has always been a focus within all cultures across all, you know, centuries to make sure that your hair was pretty and kept and well maintained, there wasn't a huge focus on that meaning you had to actually put a cleanser, like a surfactant onto your hair to achieve those goals. And we have examples of that all throughout history in all manner of different cultures, right? Like the ancient Egyptians, for example, they used essentially soap, mixture of animal fats and, you know, plant oils to cleanse. And so they would use it infrequently, like maybe once a month, if that, and then they'd wash it away. And the ancient Greeks and the Romans, I mean, obviously we know the Castile soaps and those are wildly popular, right? But before they actually turned the plant oils, the olive oils, into a soap, they were using plant oils, specifically olive oil, just directly on their scalp, massaging it in, brushing it out, and kind of just letting it do its thing. Native Americans have used natural ingredients forever to cleanse their hair, like yucca root and soap wort, you know, soap nuts, for example, cornmeal, creating like a paste to put on their hair and keep in their scalp and make sure that everything is massaged in and then rinsed out. But again, infrequent. In medieval Europe, we had an example of people using a mixture of egg yolks and wine to clean the hair. So they would actually beat the egg yolks and mix them with the wine and put it on their hair, their scalp, massage it in, rinse it out, brush it out. Like I said, lots of examples, but the biggest mainstay with all of it is they were doing this infrequently. They were not washing their hair once a week. In most cases, they weren't even washing their hair once a month. With the exception of the Japanese, they were actually doing daily hair washing very, very early on. And while they did use soap in that every once in a while, for the most part, they were cleansing their hair with more natural ingredients like soap nuts, for example, and rice water and those sorts of things. So the biggest takeaway with all of that is whatever we were doing with our hair, it was infrequent actual washing. So instead we would be doing things like brushing it. You remember the whole 100 strokes, right? Like I remember that from when I was a kid, my grandmother told me I needed to brush my hair a hundred times every day. But the point is with all of that soap or any sort of cleansing agent, this was not a daily use. This was not something that they were focusing on at all. Again, it's not that they were unhygienic. The use of a cleanser on their hair daily or frequently was not something that needed to be done, right? This was an unnecessary practice. Therefore, for thousands of years, this practice was not done. This is something I find very interesting, right? The history of how hair was cleansed over the centuries because me growing up as like a 90s kid, right? The, I, the idea that you wouldn't wash your hair every single day was absolutely cuckoo bananas. Of course you washed your hair every single day. And that is not what we have culturally seen across, you know, all of humanity as long as, as far back as we can go. Granted, some cultures did shift from time to time and they would do more hair washing, but for the most part, it really was, you know, using like a baking soda directly on the scalp and massaging it in and then following it up with something acidic, like, you know, a vinegar type solution in order to keep everything nice and shiny and clean so there's no you know dirt and debris and doesn't get tangled all the things that was basically what we were using and so this idea of washing hair daily is a more modern practice and this of course goes into what we're going to be talking about with future videos but high level shampooing of one's hair was something that was not done on the daily Okay, so oil treatments and baking soda and cornmeal and all the jazz aside, when hair had to be cleansed, right? There was one thing that was used in order to achieve that cleansing goal, and that was soap. That was a product that we make today, and we talk about a million times in all of our videos and all of our, you know, stuff as soap makers. Soap, a product that is slightly alkaline. Now, why is that necessary? Well, as I said before, with the surfactants, in order for a surfactant to actually be a surfactant and achieve its end goal of cleansing, of removing the grime and the dirt and the debris and breaking down all of those particles so that can be rinsed away with water, the only way that we knew how to create surfactants for thousands and thousands of years up until the 1930s was via the way that we create soap today. And 
for thousands and thousands of years, people used this on their hair and had no problems, you know? Have you seen pictures of like the Victorian ladies with their hair going down like past their feet and stuff? It, it's wild. They're clearly not losing hair. They're not having any problems growing hair. You know, it looks very nice and not tangled and everything. So right there, the argument that like an alkaline soap as a shampoo bar is bad for your hair actually and we can't use it or whatever. I mean, A, I do see one side of that because we know better now. We have more advancements within technology and science and all of the things. So I, I get why that argument would exist. Sure, but also thousands and thousands of years of recorded history with humanity suggests that that was actually fine to use to cleanse your hair. And you see examples of that today where there are not a lot of them, but there are indigenous tribes across the world. Tribes that have no contact with modern civilization and still live in, you know, the, the olden times or whatever with their methods. They don't have shampoo in a bottle that, you know, they don't, that doesn't exist. And when we get the rare glimpse of them because we like flew a drone over them and freaked them out, which I think is mean, but that's a different conversation in and of itself. We can see their hair and depending on the culture, they have it, you know, a lot of it, it's still there. So I don't get why this has become such a, such a hot button, like fervently held belief that you cannot use an alkaline solution on your hair or, you know, terrible things will happen because that's not what we see. I think what we can surmise from what we have seen historically in regards to, you know, hair washing or whatever is that maybe we are washing it too frequently these days and we should perhaps focus on that. Also, those bars are pretty. And there it is, a history of shampoo, how we cleansed our hair from, again, the beginning of recorded history to 1930s. And as you can see, there were a lot of different ways and methods that the hair was cleansed. One common mainstay with all of it was A, hair was not cleansed very often. And two, when it was cleansed, soap was used. I think that's important to keep in mind just generally throughout, you know, soap and shampoo. These synthetic soaps, shampoos, etc., they were only created within the last 100 years. And that's as I said earlier, not because they were intrinsically better for the skin or hair. They were created for a very specific purpose and in reality had very little to do with the creators of said shampoo or soaps really caring at all about our skin and or hair. So that's what we're going to be talking about in part two, the creation of synthetics, of synthetic detergents, both for shampoo as well as soap, but also if you think about it, you know, laundry detergent and dishwashing detergent and things like that. So stay tuned for part two where we talk about the creation of synthetic detergents, why we needed to create them in the first place, how they were used, how they were marketed, fascinating, and uh, why I think that was really the beginning of this very strange misconception that we have in life as a people that soap, synthetic soap or synthetic shampoo is actually better than the stuff that we were using for hundreds or thousands of years before. So I look forward to that. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I appreciate my sudsers each and every day. That is a fact. I am getting back in the swing of things since vacation. And uh, yeah, thanks for being here. I am finding that after a week of not filming, I don't know how to end things, so that's fun. But I will see you all again tomorrow for another round of shampoo history. Hope you fun. Yeah. Bye. Okay. I Why does my hair grow out so fast? Cool. Let's talk about shampoo some more and my hair looks weird. Love that for great.